Hey, this is Joe with Great Bench Electronics. I wanted to show some interesting germanium transistors I have in my collection. I have been collecting germanium transistors for a couple years now, and uh, I came across several of these, as you can see, over the years. Uh, these all belong to the AF11X group, which is AF114, 115, 6, 7, 8, uh, which is a, a rather infamous set of transistors. And I'll talk about why that's the case. I wanted to give you a look. So this is an AF114, and 111 is an EIA code, that is Amperex, 6730s in data manufacturer, 1967, 30th week. Flip that over, you can see there it says Holland. Uh, what else, we got some other part numbers here. They're all essentially the same transistor, same series of transistors. This is OC170. Here's an AF117, again, Amperex. Here I have a CV7089. CV is the military series uh, from the UK, CV transistors or CV electronic components. Again, this is an equivalent transistor to the AF11X series. Other markings here, KB. KB is a, they're mil like military proofs. So they're basically saying this transistor is fit for military service. And DA refers to the specific manufacturing plant. Uh, so in this case, DA is the Blackburn plant in uh, the Mullard Blackburn plant, so in Blackburn, England. OC, more OC 170s. Uh, and there's some where, there's some where the writing OC 170 is on the side. And there's some where the writing is on the top. Yeah, so OC 170s. These transistors, like I said, they're a bit infamous. Most of these are bad, and that's not particularly interesting, but the way in which they go bad is interesting. Um, and that's what I want to talk about. They have a very interesting failure mode. Um, so I'm going to do a diagram here, and we'll have a look at exactly how that happens, how they fail, and uh, what you can do about it. So here's a very crude drawing uh, diagram of the construction of the transistors, the specific package, uh, for this transistor is called TO7, so that's like TO-7. The connections are as follows. It is a PMP BJT transistor, so it's emitter, base, shield, which we'll talk about in a second, and collector. And then you have you know, your emitter and base coming up here, then little wires touching the germanium wafer, which it makes up the part of the collector. Uh, the shield is just a lead, not connected to the transistor at all. It just comes out and touches the case of the transistor, this actual outer metal bit. Uh, and that's done to help shield the transistor from interference. However, that shield is also part of the failure problem. So when these transistors are manufactured, uh, oftentimes there is a coating put on the inside of the transistor, the walls inside the metal casing here. Uh, and that coating is primarily made of tin. This is an unexplained phenomena at least there is no like official explanation for this. There are some theories. But what happens is that coating, for some reason, will spontaneously start to grow little hairs protruding out from the case. So little hairs made of tin will start to grow from the case inwards on the transistor, like this. These hairs are exceptionally thin. We're talking like a few micron. Your hair, for comparison, is about 70 microns, so significantly smaller than a human hair. Uh, but they are conductive, and they can cause a shorting path between the case of the transistor and one of the electrodes of the transistor. They also can short to two separate electrodes at the same time, therefore essentially causing a circuit between two electrodes. They short together. This will almost definitely render the transistor inoperable. So chances are, if you were to crack one of these transistors open, what you would see is inside little wires or whiskers growing out from the sides of the case uh, that potentially can touch the electrodes. Uh, they also put a, a sort of jelly in there. Uh, it's thought to be made of silicon, and it's unclear exactly what that was for, if it was to prevent oxidation or uh, perhaps to try to inhibit this growth of whiskers. That part's not clear, but what we do know is that the whiskers can grow through the jelly. So if it was an attempt to stop them, it didn't work. So that is how these fail. And it's really fascinating. Uh, it is also of significant interest to some big players.
the pictures that you just saw were courtesy of NASA. They did a study on these very transistors, not these ones exactly, but this actual part. Uh, and they used uh, electron microscope, as you saw, and uh, did a bunch of testing on them. It's really fascinating. I highly recommend checking that out. There's a link in the description. And as you can imagine, NASA is going to be very interested in seeing the ways in which electronics fail. Because obviously, with NASA, when electronics fail, it is life or death. Uh, so let's move on. Uh, now that we know how these transistors fail, let's talk about what to do about it. All right, so let's say we want to test some of our transistors to see if they actually have these whiskers, these shorts in the transistor. Uh, we can perform a test with a simple multimeter here. I'm going to set it to uh, resistance mode. Got two leads here. I'm going to clip one lead. So this is one of the where am I? It's one of the OC 170s. I'm going to clip one lead to the shield. Clip the other lead to one of the electrodes. Doesn't matter which one. Now, if we did not have whiskers, we should see open circuit. There is shields should not be touching any of the electrodes. But in this case, we see that we have a about 50 ohm path from the shield to the, in this case, emitter. Okay, some interesting behavior there. That's connecting to the collector. Let's try the base. That's 93 ohms, so that's not great either. So this transistor appears to have a short between the case uh, and the, or the shield and the uh, emitter at least, uh, which would suggest whiskers. Let's try one of these 7089s. So these are the ones that we know are made by Mullard. Uh, in this case, you might notice that it only has three leads, and that's because at some point somebody cut off the shield lead, probably to try and remedy exactly the problem we're talking about now. Onto the collector here, and touch that shield. Yes, yeah, so there's 18 ohms, it's not good. Over here on the emitter, 70 ohms. Now we can see if we touch emitter to collector, we have a 95 ohm path, which is not good. So let's try one of these AF114s made by Amperex. Clip onto the shield here. Clip onto the emitter. Nothing. Clip onto the base. Nothing. Clip onto the collector, nothing. Um, so that's been my experience testing these ones I have, that the ones made by Amperex do not have any shorts. Uh, and my guess is that they, they did not apply the tin coating to the inside of the case, which potentially means they don't have whiskers. We can also test with the transistor tester, a semiconductor tester here. This is the Peak Atlas DCA75, tried and true. We've got another one of those OC170s. Let's plug this one in and see what happens. See what it says. Yeah, so something's wrong in there. There's some shorts happening because the peak can't even detect it as a component or that anything's connected. All right, so you have a piece of electronic equipment or maybe you have a couple of these laying around and you want to try to bring these transistors back to life. There are generally four ways of going about that. So option one here is you can tap the case of the transistor, have something hard, tap the case like that, and hopefully you will dislodge any of the whiskers that are shorting out to one of the electrodes, either that or break it off. This solution is obviously a temporary solution because it doesn't stop the growth of the whiskers and it may you may not succeed in actually dislodging or breaking the whiskers. Next option, cut off the screen or the shield lead for the transistor. Uh, so this could be a more permanent solution if only one of the whiskers is shorting to one of the electrodes. This will just basically make the, the shield of the transistor floating. And if it's only shorted to one electrode, then who cares? However, if two separate whiskers join, meet one electrode, so one whisker is touching the emitter, for example, and one whisker is touching the collector, well, now your emitter and collector are shorted together and it's not gonna work. So option three is maybe the next thought, which is to replace the transistor. Uh, and this can be done. You can go for a new old stock transistor of the same type. You know, just pop in a new transistor. Problem with that is that these whiskers have been shown to uh, not necessarily be affected by use. 
What I mean by that is that new old sock transistors sitting on a shelf or in a bag are, there's no reason to believe they won't have the whiskers. It's not, the whiskers do not appear to be something that are caused by the transistor being used or not being used. So there's a good chance you replace with new old stock, you're still gonna have the same problem. If not immediately, then soon. There are other tr transistors that can work generally in those circuits. It's just a PMP BJT transistor. So the common germanium uh, suggested replacement is the AF125. Those are somewhat available. You could also try replacing with a silicon transistor. Probably gonna have to change some other components to get the transistor biased correctly. The problem with these two options is uh, they are not going to look right. They are obviously in a different case. They are going to look like replacements of discerning. I will be able to pick that out immediately. And chances are, if you are working on a piece of equipment like this, you care about the aesthetics or someone does, your customer maybe, uh, and just replacing with a like part of modern make is not necessarily going to be acceptable. Um, however, there is a fourth option, and that fourth option is to zap the shit out of them, which we are going to try today. So the idea is that the whiskers are very small in diameter, their current carrying capability is quite limited, and so therefore if we were to pass a, a quick jolt of high voltage electricity between the three electrodes of the transistor and the shield itself, we could hopefully vaporize the or the whiskers that are making shorts to the transistor without damaging the transistor itself. Now this very easily could also damage the transistor. Uh, and so if you're doing this to yours, you have to accept that risk that you may just blow up the transistor. But I mean, at this point, what do you have to lose? Um, so we're gonna try this today. We're gonna try and defibrillate some transistors. We're gonna do a 100 nanofarad cap. Uh, and we're gonna do that at, we're gonna try it at 500 volts. There are different tips out there for how to do this. And this isn't my idea, I didn't come up with this. There are other videos showing this being done. Some people recommend a higher capacitance at a lower voltage. I agree with some other people that a higher voltage seems to make more sense because then the, the arc that you will create will theoretically burn back the whisker farther uh, because that arc will be able to maintain itself over longer distance because of the high voltage. So this is where we're gonna try, 100 nanofarads at 500 volts. Uh, let's get that set up now. All right, so like I showed before, we're gonna try and use electricity to burn up those whiskers inside the transistor here. Uh, so just to do a comparison test, just gonna double check. This is one lead on the shield, one on the, in this case, emitter, 55 ohms, over here on the collector, 7.3K on the base, 94 ohms. Definitely have some low resistance paths to the shield from the electrodes in there. So this here is a insulation tester. Uh, it is a device that's usually used for testing like motors and stuff, but what I'm using it for is just a high voltage supply. Um, so I can set this to 500 volts and I can use it to give me 500 volts of DC electricity across these two leads. I'm gonna connect those up now. I'm gonna to solder together the three electrodes for the transistor. So make sure we have a good connection on all three of those. Make sure I've got the right leads, yeah, okay. I'm gonna use alligator clip to hold those together. So now those three are joined together with a ball of solder there. We've got that, let's bring our insulation tester back in screen here. We've got a capacitor here. This is a 100 microfarad, 630 volt cap. I'm going to clip this into the insulation tester here, like so. Set on 500 volts. And what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna power up the insulation tester and then I'm gonna pull one of the leads out uh, because if you let go, it drains off the cap in this device. So what I'm going to do is just press it on. It's going to charge up and show the insulation resistance we, we don't really care about. But we want to put that voltage on the capacitor. Obviously, this is going to put out 500 volts, which 
it's probably not enough to kill you with this capacitor, but don't want to take any chances. Want to be safe if you try to do this at home. It's at your own risk. Be careful. Uh, obviously, high voltage can shock the crap out of you. So be careful. All right, here we go. All right, so we're charged. Pull that lead out. A clip onto there. It's going to take the other side of this clip, like so. It's going to clip that right onto the transistor there. Okay, that's there. I'm taking this black lead. I'm attaching it to the other side of that capacitor, like that. And then I'm just going to touch it to the shield, and hopefully we see a little zap. Yep, I did see a little spark there. So if there was open circuit, then theoretically this should have done nothing uh, because the shield should not be touching the transistor at any point. However, we tested it and we know that that wasn't the case. There was a, uh, there was a short or at least a relatively low resistance path between the shield or the case of the transistor and the electrodes. Pull this aside here. Separate these transistor legs. Like so let's open them up. Okay, now we can do another test. All right, so now we can go back and test the transistor and see if we made any difference. Okay, so right away we now have an open circuit between the shield and in this case the emitter. That's good. Let's go over here to the collector. Same thing, open circuit on the collector and base, open circuit. So we did eliminate the shorting path or the, the whisker that was connecting the, I think it was the emitter to the shield. However, we're not out of the woods yet uh, because we may have also just destroyed the transistor. So let's test our transistor now with a transistor tester, see if we have made any improvements there. Here's the peak DCA75 again. Attached to our leads. All right, let's see what happens. Yeah, so there you go. It's testing as a transistor now. Zero milliamps of leakage, which is good for germanium. Zero microamps, actually. So that appears to have been a successful operation. Let's try another one. All right, so I've got one of those CV7089 transistors here. Uh, again, this is the one with the cutoff shield lead, so we're going to have to do a little something to be able to touch that. Uh, so I'm clipped onto the emitter here. It's measuring resistance to the shield. 18 ohms, which is probably a whisker. Let's try the base. Base is 8.5K. The collector, oh, sorry, this is the emitter. 1.485 meg. This is the collector, 18 ohms. So there appears to be a whisker from the shield to the collector, but there isn't whiskers touching either the other electrodes, but they could be very close. And they, you know, over the next couple months, they could grow and actually start touching that. Um, so that's one of the benefits of using high voltage is for whiskers that are exceptionally close, but not quite touching, we can still hopefully arc over to those and burn them up. We'll test this on the peak. So this is probably going to come out working because that shield is only shorting to one electrode. This is an instance where cutting off the shield lead would probably work. 208 HFE, leakage of 333 microamps, which is on the higher side, but still potentially usable. Let's give it a shock and see how that changes. Those three leads are soldered together now. The shield lead is just a little nub there. I'm just going to take a little lead stuck into the end of the alligator clip, like so. I'm going to use that to come in here and just touch, touch the shield lead there. Hopefully not shock myself in the process. Okay, let's do it. Let's double check our connections. Yeah, charge. Okay. Charging it down, pull the lead out. So now that capacitor is charged. Come in here, just give it a little touch, a little spark. Okay, so that definitely sparked. So that means there was something happened. You know, if, the, if that shield wasn't either connecting to the electrodes or wasn't at least uh, very close, then we should have, nothing should have happened. So, 
let's see if we cleared up that whisker. Or maybe we blew up the whole transistor, who knows? Let's find out. I believe it was on the collector. We had that 18 ohm path. Okay. Looks like that whisker is gone. Let's check these other leads. Yep, even that resistance, that was like uh, a few kilo ohms. And that one too. Okay, so we're now reading open circuit for the all the electrodes to the shield, which is how it should be. But we may have destroyed the transistor in the process. So let's see what happens. Now when we tested this before, we saw about 200 HFE and about 330 micro ohms of leakage or micro amps of leakage. Let's see what happens now. All right, HFE has remained the same. Leakage has reduced. Give it another run. HFE just increased and leakage we might have a little runaway situation here. You have HFE keeps increasing. So it is transistoring, but might be having some thermal runaway issues with this one. As it goes, you know, germanium transistors, always all kinds of quirks and whatnot. But we did eliminate those shorts, which is a good thing. We brought the transistor closer to operation. It might have independent problems. All right, so I hope you found this video enjoyable or informative. I want to reiterate that I was not the first person to talk about these tin whiskers. The idea of tin whiskers has been around for decades and they have been talking about whiskers in these transistors in a thread at the UK Antique Radio Forums for a while. I'll put a link to that in the description as well as a link to that NASA study where they actually looked at these transistors inside, took some great pictures, which you saw. And also there's some YouTube videos of people uh, performing the same procedure we did today of trying to shock these transistors back to life. Um, so links for all that is in the description. Go and check that out if you're interested. If you did enjoy the video, I'd appreciate you hitting the like button. And if you want to see more videos like this, feel free to subscribe, hit the notification bell. My name is Joe from Great Bench Electronics. Thank you for watching.